for the humanities and the Theatre Mundi in London. But if I should give him a fair presentation by naming everything that he has founded and started and invented and written, we would be here all night. So I'll just sum it up with this. Richard Sennett is an intellectual in the true sense of the word. He's always contagiously insightful and interesting in his books as well as on his Twitter account. So I'm very glad to present Professor Richard Sennett. can't see you all, but uh, that's all right. Uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about uh, a project that I'm currently involved in. About three years ago, uh, I uh, uh, was seconded from the, I was moved from the London School of Economics to the United Nations, where I've been a consultant all, off and on most of my life. And the project that we set up was a project on cities and climate change. And it is a project that has challenged, uh, for me, uh, the kinds of work I've been recently doing on open cities. It's made me rethink a lot of the things that, uh, uh, in my books, I've been trying to, to understand about the value of open cities. So what I'm going to talk to you briefly about tonight, I have a huge clock here, which is very intimidating. <laughs> I'm going to forget it, and so should you, uh, is uh, uh, just a few of the issues that uh, this uh, effort has, uh, um, has raised for me. I also want to pay um, to, to acknowledge my colleagues, Morgana Schwab and Peter Elmlund of the Oxford Johnson Foundation, with whom we're working on this project on cities and climate change. The Oxford Johnson Foundation is based here in Stockholm. So as I say, what I want to explore with you briefly is the relation between uh, climate change and open cities. And I, I suppose I should first just define very um, quickly for you what uh, the, the concerns I've, I've had about what makes the city open. And it's got two parts. It's architectural and physical and social. On the architectural side, I'm interested in how to make cities more porous that is to break down the modernist assumption that each function has a separate place in the city. I want to, I want to mobilize the edges between different places and blur uh, different functions in urban space to make the city a more porous um, medium uh, so that you get synergy between different kinds of parts. I'm very interested, as you may know in my work, in incomplete forms, how to half-build things rather than completely, so that new generations can adopt, adapt structures as the ways of life change. We have very rigid urban environments, again inherited from the modernist uh, past, uh, which can't evolve easily. And finally, a lot of my work, and this has been based on pretty much on my consulting for the UN, emphasizes informal space because uh, in developing cities, poor cities, informal space is the space of the city, that the spaces large numbers of migrants colonize um, uh, both economically and to live, are places that are not planned for them to be there. 
So that's an open city to me on its physical side. On its social side, I think that these physical forms of openness enable a kind of democratic life, which is participatory, as we say, from the ground up. They disable arbitrary state planning and enable people to themselves shape the environment in which they live. And that to me is what urban democracy is all about. So my question was for this, uh, that's what I believe in, what is, what difference does climate, the challenges of climate change uh, make in these kinds of practices. And I'm going to show you some work uh, that um, uh, in three parts that uh, I think uh, uh, concretizes uh, these, uh, these issues. First, I think that climate change creates a crisis in porosity due to climate migrants. And I'm going to show you an example of that. I'm terrible on text, so if this all disappears, oh, I get to see it. I've been working off and on in Somalia over about three decades. And what is happening now in Somalia is uh, that there's a process of massive desertification going on at the edge of the in the, uh, in the Sahel uh, due to not s really um, uh, uh, increases in temperature, that's a very, uh, climate temperature, that's a very crude way to think about climate change, but rather with the, the uh, disappearance of uh, our water tables on the edge of the Sahel uh, due to a combination of factors which can be uh, traced back to the same forces that enable climate change and of, of a temperature sort. So what I'm going to show you here is what this desertification looks like and then what its consequences are for migration and then what its consequences are for cities. H here, wait a minute, I have to press this. Here, well, oh, I see. here, oh, I see it here. Here is a uh, uh, photo I took 11 years, uh, no, eight years ago in Somalia of a well uh, which enabled uh, 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 farmers and, and Bedouin also to cultivate the land around uh, this well. Uh, in the last eight years, the well has begun to dry up, you can, as you can see there. Uh, the result of that is that this is the, what the landscape looks like now. I just, I just play these back to you because it's, if I can, if this thing works. So this is, you know, this was a way of life that was sustainable for hundreds of years for these farmers in, yes, this is eight years that this has occurred and this is the result. Now, what does this have to do with open cities? The mediation to that is that what I've shown you in uh, uh, Somalia, down on the bottom here, is happening throughout a vast band of uh, the Sahel uh, and uh, through e Ethiopia and, and into Somalia. That is that uh, the uh, desertification is driving, it makes it impossible for people to, to live any longer off the land. Our calculation of this, this map is that there are about 160 million uh, people who will be displaced in this way. And of that 160 million, 
uh, we estimate current, that by, displaced by 2060, we estimate that a third to 40% will come, try to come to Europe. If you think about the consequences for this politically, they're frightening. A million and a half refugees during the Bosnian-Serbian uh, crisis, uh, uh, excuse me, a million and a half refugees during the, the Iraqi and, uh, 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 war, uh, uh, cost in a uh, Syrian war, cost an enormous right-wing upheaval in Europe. That's about a million and a half people who tried to come, provoked this hideous reaction to the right. What we're talking about is a factor of between 40 and 60 times those migrants who, um, uh, 40 or 60 times those refugees who are going to try to come to Europe. It's a kind of unimaginable uh, political crisis, but it's also an urban crisis. Under the best case scenario, if everybody uh, were like you Swedes who were very, as I know from working here in the 90s, were very hospitable in a way other European countries weren't to people in the Balkans war, where would they go? Uh, probably they wouldn't be able to farm and that they'd go to cities. And the issue is what will change in the physical fabric of cities, assuming the best case scenario, which say of the 60 million, even 20, a third, 20 million, were led into Europe somehow. The, most of them will, uh, our predictions show, not begin farming again, because they don't know how to farm this way, but to try within the informal economy of cities uh, to try and reestablish themselves, just the way people do now in who are migrants in, um, in Southeast Asia or South America when they move to cities. And in terms of the issue about open city theory, the uh, ideal open city theory is, can you have a porous, maintain a porous city under those conditions of vast numbers of migrants who are displaced by forces like desertification who come in? There are two alternatives. One is that the center of cities would become much, much more dense. And the other, which is, as you know, in, in Stockholm was, a, was a very mixed solution is to create further suburbanization, peripheralization, which where these people would live, which has its own uh, social and also economic deficits because they're isolated on the periphery. So I think for urban planners and urban designers, we're just a small part of this problem. But it is a problem in how do we, does the city become, can it become more porous under the weight of even this third of these migrants who managed to come here? Or does it have to reconfigure itself as is the case in Mexico City with a kind of endless suburban peripheral sprawl, which is also segregating? So that's one issue that by a series of knock-ons that I think climate change is relevant uh, uh, to urbanists. Now I want to show you something else which I think is perhaps more relevant to architecture itself. Um, I, I never make that difference, but everybody else does. So. Uh, um, One of the things we know about uh, now that we didn't know uh, when the Paris Accords were negotiated uh, a few years ago is that 
because of the um, interactions of the climate forces that actually climate change is speeding up more than we had uh, originally predicted at the time of the Paris Accords. That is the window of opportunity uh, to do something is shrinking because once we do, to use that crude measure, go over two degrees Celsius warming, uh, the game is up, you know. I think actually it's 1.65, I don't know, I'm no expert on this, but, or I'm, but I'm learning. But I think it's actually a, a, a lower number but the point about this is that predictions that said we have a generation or two to address climate change are wrong. We have maybe 12 or 13 years before its irreversible effects are, uh, appear and are catastrophic. And that compression of time makes a great difference in the practice of w how we put the weight on mitigation in building against climate change or on adaptation to it. And I'm going to try and explain that to you by uh, just some examples we're, we're working with. This mitigation is to the familiar forms of mitigation are, you know, less car use. Uh, which is great. Uh, but there is beyond that, at a kind of larger infrastructural level, the notion that cities in particular, and, and in particularly cities on water, can um, mitigate the effects of storm surges and tsunamis, which are going to increase with uh, 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 frequency uh, un under this uh, un under this uh, uh, this change in climate, things that were uh, uh, like storm surges in in my hometown in New York City, that were once in a hundred year events are now happening every other year, and that's going to be true in Britain. It's going to be true probably throughout the Mediterranean. So. Under that pressure, the response is, let's build objects which can mitigate that kind of uh, catastrophic climate events, which is a, a tsunami or storm, uh, storm surge. Here in Rotterdam is an example of one of the most it's a thing of beauty to me. It's a storm surge barrier that, uh, I'll show you how it works. Um, it, you can see how it opens and closes. It's an engineering feat. It's massive. And the thing about it is it took 45 years to construct. And I, if any of you who worked with the Dutch know that they're extremely efficient. Uh, uh, am I being diplomatic? Yes. Uh, even so, to construct something like this, which works as mitigation, is a, a work of two generations. And we haven't got that time. So uh, a project like this is fated if we did new projects like this, say in Cal in um, uh, Mumbai, for instance, which is thinking about trying to build something like this. Um, uh, time would overwhelm us. Uh, by contrast, this is a this is a Rem Koolhaas adaptive uh, project about storm surges. And this is basically a house that's on a set of uh, uh, recycled plastic pillows. So it rises up when the storm comes uh, and sinks down when it's, when it's over. The problem with it is that it's very small scale. 
It's a brilliant idea about adaption to climate change, but it's not uh, systematically uh, uh, um, possible. I couldn't put it, I don't think, even for Ram Kulhaus, the idea of putting a 40-story skyscraper uh, on pillows is thinkable. But here's another kind of example that we need to think about. This is, Phoenix, Arizona is uh, desertifying at a rapid rate, and its temperatures are rising constantly due to the fact that it's building more and more highways, which are bringing in, uh, not temperatures are rising, but its pollution is rising, due to the fact that it's building more and more highways, bringing more traffic into the city and so on. So uh, another green, kind of green proposal made by a student of mine is to plant in all the interstices of highways, plant trees. No more grass, no more little shrubs, but trees, thick, thick trees. And unfortunately, this is a great, she did a wonderful proposal, but it would take 30 years for these trees to kick in. Uh, and as I say, that's too late because of this acceleration of time. So what we're interested in uh, uh, in the UN is, and what we're trying to fund, are um, projects which don't take a lot of time and which uh, can be done relatively cheaply, but which are focused more on adaption than mitigation. Although it's, a, it, it's, it's a difficult to, to se separate that entirely, uh, the, the concept. But this is adaptive, uh, th this adaptive procedure is something that we want to focus on in such a way that ordinary people from the bottom up can practice effectively uh, some kind of response to climate change. Um, and I just give you an example of this. This is cool seal goo. It's a water-based titanium infused uh, product which you spread over uh, dark surfaces like roads, which are macadam, uh, and which absorb heat during the day, hold it during the night, and then give it up, but the cycle of sun has already gone on. It's intuitively obvious. If you've ever thought, why are Greek houses white? It's because white repels the sun, and dark stone would take it in. So we are doing a lot of experiments in Los Angeles and New York about how communities, if we can get the price of this material down, how communities could begin to practice not making the climate change itself slow down, but how a community could work with increases of climate change to repel the heat that's locally there. Um, in New York, we've just, this is a project we just did to coat a whole building with uh, a cool seal. And uh, the most er innovative part of this, which is in uh, LA, is to combine painting all the roads in, in this part of the city white with this this material and combine it with a bioswale, which is basically just a hole in the ground into which you put a certain kind a set of plants um, which purify acid rain, which is another aspect of climate change. The, you know what that is. And the plants actually are super effective in um, in dealing with uh, the acid, acid rainfall. So combined together, this is something that is a response 
uh, that makes a difference, but it's something that communities can do bottom up. And the reason I'm interested in that, in terms of open cities things, is that it's, it's designs like this which enable that kind of participation um, that is the essence of, uh, of open city, of the open city proposal. That is the environment that people live in is an environment they make. That's basically the the principle that we're trying to get at. And in this way, responding to cool seal, in, uh, responding uh, to heat and uh, to lack of water by, this is a very simple innovation, these bioswales, it's not rocket science. It doesn't need Le Corbusier, you know? It's something that, that was actually do, uh, done by two Latino uh, young women working in the Los Angeles um, uh, planning office who just observed that these plants do uh, a good job of cleaning water and that uh, they could be put out in the open and survive. They're waterborne plants. So that, whereas the migration thing that I've described to you is something which is probably something that open cities uh, can't deal with. Uh, acts of, of working with, adaptation to, uh, is something which falls within the framework, I think, of what an open city ideal is. Um, I guess the last thing I would uh, like to say to you, I've seen this clock, it's horrible. Uh, about this is the larger thing that I have um, uh, contemplated about, which I, I hadn't really before, is the idea of a cornucopia. Basically, urban development assumes that physical development can go on and on and on. That if there's a problem, you make more structure, it's the same thing that in economics, that growth is something that can, you can grow your way out of inequality, which is what the Chinese tried to do. And we as, as people who work with the physical environment have a version of that, which is if you make new things, um, that, that the city is a kind of cornucopia of physical opportunities. And what the climate crisis has done has, it's a wake-up call that the idea of the cornucopia, which was also fundamental to the development of capitalism, has come to an end. That nature is not a cornucopia. It's not endlessly, you can't mine it endlessly. Uh, and the, what we have to think about instead is not growing more city, but think about ways of remaking it internally and even more than that, redistributing uh, the goods that are already in it. That instead of growth, uh, we need uh, redistribution. This is a matter uh, at the economic level of um, of economic redistribution against the 1% or the 4% uh, uh, who, who have hoarded most of the resources in the city. But it is also an, uh, a question for us, which is how do we avoid something like, for instance, concentrating all the resources for education or hospitals or, uh, or culture in the center of cities? How do we redistribute uh, the resources that we're building? Uh, which takes us back to the whole idea of making more porosity instead of making more functional spaces. So with this idea that the cornucopia is exhausted, has, it seems to me, I haven't really worked it out in certainly in any kind of thing that we can practice in the UN. 
but it seems that the ideology of development which we've had, which has really um, dominated modern mentality, has now got to come to an end. And instead of development, we need redistribution. Thank you very much.